My name is Roy Kukwe. I am creator and executive producer on The Ianu Show. My name is Kerry Grant, and I'm a writer on Ianu. My name is Vincent Edwards, and I'm the supervising director on Ianu, and I heard cats. <laughs> Well, a lot of pain. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. I can't deny that. But um, they say nothing good comes easy. So um, I'm very happy that all the hard work and everything that I have put into Iano. And, um, and first of all, I want to also include Godwin Akban, who was the illustrator on Iano as well. Like a lot of credit has to go to him as well. Uh, we both worked on the graphic novel. Um, and since then, other artists have come on board. But it's it's a very humbling experience um, to go from writing a graphic novel, putting it on Kickstarter, getting people to support it, you know, creating multiple volumes, then having a producer in interested in it, getting it greenlit by Cartoon Network, having Lionforge come on board to produce it and to be here today. It's like it's been a very long journey, but um, I think everything over the last maybe 15 years since I've been trying to get to this point has prepared me for where I am today, because I, I don't think I would be the producer or creator that I am in this position to do a fantastic job if I didn't go through some of the, the trials and tribulations. So very happy. Um, again, it's been a lot of work, but I can't wait for people to check out what we've been putting together. Uh, I mean, I don't think one can exist without the other. Um, uh, I'm proudly Nigerian, um, and growing up in Lagos, Nigeria, I've always, I always fantasized of about what a show like Avatar: The Last Airbender would feel like if it had Nigerian culture influenced in it. So, um, to me, it's one of the most important aspects of Iyanu is is the the cultural authenticity um, to Nigeria, specifically the Yoruba culture. Um, but I always tell people that even though this, this specificity is very, very important and it's something that on ev every single day we're trying to make sure it, it's, um, it stays true to the culture, Iyanu is for everybody. Um, I grew up loving characters like Spider-Man, not because they were American, but because I could see myself in Peter Parker. You know, I got bullied as well and like I've always wanted powers to stand up to my bullies and help other people. So. Um, I still get bullied by Vincent. Hey. By the way. So, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. But uh, no, it's on a more serious <laughs> note. Is uh, Iyanu is for everybody, and um, I can't wait for people to check it out. Well, I think um, we had a really great team. We had a really tight team, starting with um, Roy, of course, who created the graphic novel, and Brandon Easton, who was our head writer, myself, and then we also had two other writers in the room, Ivory Floyd and Matt Wayne, and everybody, it was like an all hands on deck situation. We would, um, you know, Roy, of course, created the world and the mythologies and the rules and all of that, and we were all in the room together creating this mm -hmm. and, and, you know, um, laying out the foundation to bring this to life. Brandon did a lot of that groundwork, um, just sort of as our head writer, you know, and he and Roy worked together in um, creating the arc for the season, the characters, making sure that um, all the information from the books, you know, from the graphic novel was incorporated into the world and how um, fleshing out characters to make them... Um, they were already three-dimensional, uh, multi-dimensional in the graphic novels, but come, you know, bringing them to life on screen, that really just kind of took, how many of us were in there? Five? It was like we were a hand. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so we really just, just like we were just uh, fingers on a hand. Um, and, and, and we just came to get to bring it all together. So that's one thing about creating a show. Um, the writing is, it's a team. Um, bringing the show together as a whole, hundreds if not thousands of people are involved, but mm -hmm. um, we all had to work really closely together, um, just talking it out and laying it out, and then because, um, and then making sure that things were connecting and lining up, there was continuity and all of that stuff, so, yeah. I think, I mean, that's a fantastic question, and I'm, I'm going to piggyback on what um, Kerry said. 
a lot of people don't understand, a, a writer's room can be a very charged atmosphere because you, when you have a lot of creative people with a lot of creative ideas, it's, it's not something that's always easy to balance, but you have to give credit to, to Brandon as the head writer because he was put in a position that it's not very easy, right? So you have somebody who is a creator that has um, a vision for, okay, here's what I did in the books and I would like X, Y, and Z to be in the show. Um, but you, all, you also have to think of a graphic novel isn't, you know, an animated series, right? So there's so many things that you have to parse in a way where it's like, okay, we'll stay true to the book here, but what are some of the things that we can tweak? But one of the things that I loved about the room, it was never about taking anything away from the graphic novel. It was either let's do this the same way or let's tweak this as well. Um, and I don't even know if you remember, Brandon on our first couple of days, he would put like these large, um, what do they call those things? Like those huge easel, easel pads. pads. Like things. we had like maybe like 20 of them yeah. around the room. Yeah. And he sort of like mapped out the entire season based on what the graphic novels were. Um, but I think that really helped us set the foundation of getting clarity on where we wanted to go and us agreeing as a team about, okay, here's a story that we want to tell and here's how we want to tell it for um, the animated series and here are some of the things we want to bring from the graphic novel as well. Well, I gotta give a lot of credit to, again, to Godwin, our art director, who's mm -hmm. just an amazing, amazing guy in terms of his, his breadth of knowledge about design mm -hmm. and his, his versatility in terms of being able to react to the needs of the story creative, which is where, as a director, I come in at the story level, right? So the, what's on the page and the script is one story, but what goes on screen when you're looking at moving images and characters that aren't actually alive, they're cartoons, right? <laughs> but they seem to be alive if they're executed well. And the world <laughs> and the and the world they inhabit, it feels real if it's executed well. And so the the real challenge for us um, as a storytelling team is to accurately and authentically represent what does that world really want to feel like in its best incarnation? How do these characters really want to react in a way that feels true to who they are on the script page, right? How do we relate to them as, as, as though they're real people? How do they affect us emotionally as, as characters so that we care about their journey and we care about the things that are happening in our story? That's where I come in. My, my job is to help bring all of that into a place of being alive instead of a, a static image on a page, which is very entertaining, and I love graphic novels forever, but animation's a different animal. Did you just take a shot at graphic novels? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm saying they're just different. <laughs> they're just different, that's all. Yeah, I mean, that's a, an excellent question. I think I said this in another interview. So there's two parts, right? So there's the cultural aspect where I have a lot of rules, and I'm sure people are tired of, yes. of hearing my voice. <laughs> Some people are tired of me um, basically saying, it has to be done this way, it has to be done this way. But um, I say that jokingly, but one thing that I can definitely say about this team is that we all respect the culture, and we all want to do right by the people that we're representing um, in this show. And that's all the way from development to the writer's room to production, pre-production. That has always been something that everybody came to the table with, like, okay, we want to do it right. You know, I think we also have to give credit to Lionford Entertainment um, for not just trying to jump on a bandwagon of, oh, you know, this, 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 you know, country is hot, like this Afrobeats. Like, they actually intentionally want to do right by the culture. And one of the, the, the first things that really made me happy was when we decided that we were going to use um, Nigerian and African voices to voice the characters. Um, because to me, that, that, was, that was something that was really, really important. Like, if you're doing a show about Nigerian people, they have to sound like Nigerian and not have, like, a generic African accent that we've seen, um, you know, in the past in, in, in some other, um, you know, TV shows as well. So, there, yes, there was, there's a lot of rules when it comes to the cultural side of it. And then from the lore... Um, you know, I was also saying this in, in another interview where it's like, when I first spoke to Brandon, before we started um, in the writer's room, I sent him a 50-page document about, it wasn't even about what happens in the current story. This was just the backstory. 
of a thousand years. And I'm sure Brandon was like, what the hell is this guy? <laughs> but again, um, you know, it was, it was something that I feel like, you know, in, in terms of Brandon showing respect to the material, he was like, this is great. And every single person that came in the room from that point on, one of the things that he required was for them to go through that document. Um, and I think that shows in what you see in the writing and now obviously what you're going to be seeing in the different clips as, as, we, as we go along. So yes, there, there's a lot of rules, but they're not just done to be like, oh, here's what Roy wants to do. It's more of, here's a vision and here's this huge sandbox that we should play in and then there's sometimes that we have ideas that go outside, the sign, uh, outside that sandbox, but it's a discussion among the team first. Like, okay, if we're gonna break one of the rules, like we're talking about her eye glow and some of these other things, we have a discussion about it before we go that route. So I think it's just a testament to the teamwork um, and just, again, how everybody is really, really tr true to the story and true to the authenticity of Iyana as well. Can I take on that? Yes, please. So is this like the no peanut butter and jelly on Thursday rule? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but, but seriously, uh, with regard to that 50-page document, you know, one of the things that I keep thinking about is another really famous franchise. Star Wars. That, um, you know, allegedly had like six episodes of movie history mapped out before they made The New Hope, right? Like first, episode four is first. So what happened with the Yanu is we've got multiple different points in the thousand year arc of this universe mm -hmm. and we're finding figuring out how that worked yeah. that was a major feat of writerly ledger domain man i gotta say i'm really impressed with where that landed so i hope the audience is too so what i'm hearing is that we like that we got material for spinoffs like, in, in oh yeah, yeah hell yeah <laughs> yes 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 most definitely Well, I think the foundation was already there in what Roy created. Um, and I think like uh, in adapting the material, in working on adapting the material from the book to the screen, I always want to maintain a connection mm -hmm. to the source material as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So there were times when even like writing the script, I would literally flip through the, the graphic novel um, to really get a sense of the character's voice, um, and even like use some of what was in the novel, in the script, and tweaking it, of course, for TV. Because, of course, reading is a different experience than, than, than watching, and the way people speak kind of changes a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, yeah, I always want to maintain a, that connection because the books were already beautiful and amazing and popular and had a fan base. And so we, want to, we, want, we don't want to alienate the fans, people who have been fans, and we want to bring more people on. So that's one thing. And then I think we talked, I don't remember, I think it was you who said it, Vincent, or maybe it was Brandon, but one thing we talk a lot about with writing is that the more specific a story is, somehow the more universal it is. So we wanted to, you know, like Roy said, there was this whole document laying out this thousand year history. There was a world that was already created. It's a very specific story about um, the coming of age of this girl who's coming into her powers and now all of the surrounding people who make up this world. Um, and in that specificity, it's universal. Like the themes are universal. Humans will just see themselves in, this, in these characters and these stories. Um, and. Um, I think it's like a, a great combination of being um, heartfelt, serious, funny, mm -hmm. action-packed, mm -hmm. and I feel like that will that's what gets families yeah. on on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. Like the kids will enjoy it. There's something for everyone. The kids will enjoy it. Parents are gonna um, are gonna enjoy it too because there's. I think we all. Um, I studied mythology in school, and I think that. One of the reasons uh, like shows like, or movies, franchises like Star Wars <laughs> hits, and I th think ours will, is because it gets people on a primal level. Like I think mm -hmm. humans just recognize story and understand story. Like mythology is all about creating stories um, that explain the world, mm -hmm. you know? And then in, even though we're using words, we're creating images with those words. Mm -hmm. and, um, and when you create a mythology, that's essentially what you're doing, you're creating or coming up with an explanation for why the world is what it is. And if you pay attention, the same themes come up over and over and over again. So 
Um, I think I think we definitely had all those conversations um, in the room when we were thinking of the stories, talking about the characters, their journeys, really getting to the heart of what their journeys were really about um, on the deepest, most primal level. Ah, oh, dude, <laughs> that's just so wrong. <laughs> we haven't seen it yet. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, it's been a really, really um, long road to through for development of this as an animated project, and it's been a lot of iterations to find just the right flavor of what this authentically wants to be. And it's only really kind of fairly recently that we finally found just the right spot where we're like, yeah, that's her, you know? And, and when we did, for me, when we did have that moment where we're like, finally, we finally found her, there she is, right? Now let's just keep doing that thing, right? Um, that felt good, so, yeah. Um, there's a, and I'm, and I'm not spoiling this because this is in the graphic novel, there's a scene in the graphic novel where Iyanu, um, is running away from an evil version of Echo. Echo is like Yano's spirit animal. And he's about to basically blast her out of uh, to oblivion. And she touches him and she takes away the corruption on him. Like it's a very, very emotional scene in the book. Um, when I saw that for the first time in, in one of the episodes, I can't say what episode that is. Um, I think that for us, that was a, a really cool moment. Like. Everybody was just so like emotional to see like literally you're, t you're seeing something from the graphic novel and you're seeing it almost verbatim in the um, show, but it's the same and it's different at the same time. And it's such an emotional moment um, that I, for me, it was, I almost, I almost started to cry um, for a couple of different reasons, because obviously as somebody who created the graphic novels, being able to see the characters go from being static to moving, to talking, to, to hearing the music behind, the sound design, the sound effects. And then obviously the moment between these two key characters, it was, I can't wait for people to see it. Um, so for me, that was, that was just, that was a, that's a moment I remember for the rest of my life, just being able to see um, something transition directly from the book to the show that's so, so powerful and so emotional. No, when Roy was talking, I was thinking, oh, this, it's kind of like an egg being hatched. Yep. You know, yep. like there's yep. this thing and it's in there and it's gestating um, and, and it existed in a different form before. And now we're getting to really see it um, brought into the world in this way. And I mean, I know, I know when I saw it, the first thing I noticed was how the characters move, you know, because that, that's that physical movement that you yeah. can't, really have in the same way in the novels. Yeah. And then you put the music and the, the depth of the backgrounds and the colors and the details um, with what the artists created and you know, with this, just the create, the, the details in terms of um, everything, the costumes, hair, um, the types of trees, yeah. like everything. It just really created all of these layers um, that that felt like a like I said like a three dimensional chicken chick coming out of an egg. Was it a giant chick? <laughs> Yeah, well, GOC fans, um, stay tuned for Iyanu. I can tell you it's coming out in 2025. I said 2020. I didn't Sometime. say anything around here. 2025, GOC fam, and we can't wait for you to see the, the awesomeness that is the Iyanu animated series. So check it out when it comes out. And for, in the meantime, you can check out the graphic novels right now. So.